Hey, thanks everyone. Thank you, Marita, and uh, thank everyone for joining us on those those of you who are not in Boston are probably warmer than <laughs> than we are here in Somerville or Malden or Medford or Brookline. Um, but nothing like a conversation about poetry uh, to warm things up. And I really I'm so grateful to Jill McDonough for joining us, Jill actually lives in the Boston area. But she's in New York today. For fun. And what better reason? <laughs> and um, uh, Jill, uh, well, I guess we were friends before we were colleagues, but we were colleagues for a long time. And I admired Jill's work for I met uh, you because I was working for Gail. I was I was uh yes, I turned and the lights on and off at the blacksmith house. So I guess that I didn't that's have to how pay. my three probably, it cost three dollars to go to the blacksmith house and I didn't have it. So I I would turn the lights on and off so that I didn't have to pay my three dollars. I guess that's how we met. Yeah. And then uh turns out um Jill is a wonderful poet um who has five books now. Six. Six. Yep, the chat book counts. Um, there's a book that's just all poems about James Bond movies. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And um, this is this is her brand new book out from Alice James, and I keep thinking to myself, um, this must be autobiographical because <laughs> the title is American Treasure, and I think Jill is. An American treasure. Aww. And, um, so I, um, oh, I see. Uh, we are. Um, you, you might be interested to know that there are people joining us from California today, and from London, uh, and from Arlington. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. And Somerville, of course and uh malden um the, what you see behind marita um uh, is an image of the malden public library which is one of the great american libraries and certainly one of the most beautiful designed by h h richardson mm. and um uh marita thank you for inviting me to visit, um, uh, which I did a couple of weeks ago. And I think uh, anyone who is in the area, um, you, you're in for a real treat um, uh, visiting, visiting the library. And it's on the orange line. It is on the orange line. Yeah. Uh, which is not really working very well right now. Yeah, that's that's been true. <laughs> so, um, uh, one of my favorite of Jill's poems, and 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 a poem that I've really been looking forward to having us all um, talk about, and I'm so glad uh, is Accident Mass Ave, which is from Jill's second book. Yeah, because the first one's all sonnets about executions. Yeah, uh, that that cheery subject. Yeah, America. America. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I think I would just now. Um. I'd be so grateful if you could read us "Accident Mass Ave." Yeah. Let me pull it up. Accident Mass Ave. I stopped at a red light on Mass Ave in Boston, a couple blocks away from the bridge, and a woman in a beat up old Buick backed into me, like cranked her wheel rammed right into my side. I drove a Chevy pickup truck. It being Boston, I got out of the car yelling, swearing at this woman, a little woman whose first language was not English, but she lived and drove in Boston too. So she knew, we both knew, that the thing to do is get out of the car, slam the door as hard as you fucking can, and yell things like, what the fuck were you thinking? You fucking blind? What the fuck is going on? 
Jesus Christ. So we swore at each other with perfect posture, unnaturally angled chins. I threw my arms around, sudden jerking motions with my whole arms, the backs of my hands toward where she had hit my truck. But she hadn't hit my truck. She hit the tire, no damage done. Her car was fine too. We saw this while we were yelling and then we were stuck. The next line in our little drama should have been, look at this fucking dent. I'm not paying for this shit. I'm calling the cops, lady. Maybe we'd throw in a, you're in big trouble, sister. Or I just hope for your sake, there's nothing Mm -hmm. wrong with my fucking suspension. That sort of thing. But there was no fucking dent. There was nothing else for us to do. So I stopped yelling and she looked at the tire she'd backed into. Her little eyebrows pursed and worried. She was clearly in the wrong. I was enormous and I'd been acting as if I'd like to hit her. So I said, well, there's nothing wrong with my car, nothing wrong with your car. Are you okay? She nodded and started to cry. So I put my arms around her and I held her middle of the street, Mass Ave, Boston, a couple blocks from the bridge. I hugged her and I said, we were scared, weren't we? And she nodded and we laughed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love that you love this poem. Um, I, you know, my my big sacrifice is that I ask you to read it because I love reading it out loud myself, <laughs> and I recommend it. Um, I recommend it to everyone uh, listening. You get to today. say "fuck" so many times. Yeah, I guess you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, I would just, um, yeah, Jennifer says you should read it too, Lloyd. Oh, okay. I Do guess it. I could, I, yeah. you know, Susan's you don't have nodding. To, Everybody you don't wants have, it, Lloyd. You don't have to, you don't have to twist my arm. <laughs> uh, Give the people what they want, Lloyd. Uh, I mean, although I have to say one of the problems I have reading this poem which is one of the problems I have with reading some of my other favorite poems out loud is that I kind of choke up by the end of it. And I am so moved by what happens at the end that it's really, sometimes it's just hard to get the words out. So I'll, I'll, I have to just hear you in my head uh, when I do this, but, but thanks. Accident Mass Ave. I stopped at a red light on Mass Ave in Boston, a couple blocks away from the bridge, and a woman in a beat up old Buick backed into me, like cranked her wheel, rammed right into my side. I drove a Chevy, I drove a Chevy pickup truck. It being Boston, I got out of the car yelling, swearing at this woman, a little woman whose first language was not English. But she lived and drove in Boston too. So she knew, we both knew, that the thing to do is get out of the car, slam the door as hard as you fucking can, and yell things like, what the fuck were you thinking? You fucking blind? What the fuck is going on? Jesus Christ. So we swore at each other with perfect posture, unnaturally angled chins. I threw my arms around, sudden jerking motions with my whole arms, the backs of my hand towards where she had hit my truck. But she hadn't hit my truck. She hit the tire. No damage done. Her car was fine too. We saw this while we were yelling and then we were stuck. The next line in our little drama should have been, look at this fucking dent. I'm not paying for this shit. I'm calling the cops, lady. Maybe we throw in a, you're in big trouble, sister, or I just hope for your sake, there's nothing wrong with my fucking suspension. That sort of thing. But there was no fucking dent. There was nothing else for us to do. So I stopped yelling. And she looked at the tire she'd backed into, 
her little eyebrows pursed and worried. She was clearly in the wrong. I was enormous, and I'd been acting as if, it, as if I'd like to hit her. So I said, well, there's nothing wrong with my car, nothing wrong with your car. Are you okay? She nodded and started to cry. So I put my arms around her and I held her middle of the street, Mass Ave, Boston, a couple blocks from the bridge. I hugged her and I said, we were scared, weren't we? And she nodded and we laughed. Oh, Lloyd, you're such a good reader. I miss hearing you read all the time. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, twist my arm. <laughs> um, I, this is such a joy, such a joy. Um, John. John. Boy, could I suggest that you send a recording of this to the Smithsonian? So that we, your version of it, so that we can hear you swearing or saying fucking at least five or six times. This is probably the first time you've ever done that. I mean, <laughs> out loud. Oh, Lloyd's besides a good swearer. Besides reading the poem. Besides reading no, no, the poem. no. I, 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 I have actually read this poem in public before. Okay, okay. <laughs> but but the, in any case, the Smithsonian I... needs a version of it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, such a great reading. A really good reading of it. Well, I'm following in great footsteps today. <laughs> so, you know, wait, I want to tell you, Judy Goldman taught this, our, our colleague uh, at UMass <laughs> Boston. And I love the idea of Judy swearing because we're both laugh, like she would never, she's so prim. Um, but all of her students, not all of them, but a bunch of them decided that like, although a woman wrote it, it must be in the voice of a man. They decided that I invented this male persona because a woman wouldn't act like this. And I was like, oh, weird. I've, yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, maybe I, it's because I'm enormous. I don't know which part it was that like made her, the students were convinced that like, yeah, not a lady. It is funny, Judy, Judy Goldman was the chair of the English department and and is a very elegant and incredibly smart. And I mean, obviously smart because she read your poem. <laughs> um, um, but it is, I've never heard her read it. And I, I, would, I would pay to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know, several, several questions come to mind, but maybe we, we should sort of start with the start with the the big questions which are you know w which is really um what do you like about this poem or i'm assuming you like this poem uh because you're such smart people <laughs> <laughs> and um but what are some of the things that you that you like about it what engages you um if i may uh Michael, yeah. yeah, I'll just jump in. Uh, I like the contrast. The emotional contrast, I think, is insightful between the sort of the anger, which is tempered by the formality of it. There are allusions to the formality of Boston anger on the road and so forth. And so this is the right, the right linguistic register to be addressing each other in, in this situation. However, the, the shift from violence uh, to the to the sort of ease, easing up of it at the end uh, and the embrace. I I don't know. It's far fetched. I was thinking of of uh, Achilles giving in to Priam and letting him take Hector's body there at the end. <laughs> so it's it's right in line with poetry and the sort of the emotional insight. It's it's not it's not anger. Isn't anger is a symptom of fear. And I think in our time, if you look at our language, uh, Jill is pretty much spot on if you go down to the street and listen to people talk, whether they are emotionally charged or not, there are F-bombs everywhere today. That's just how people talk. I rue it endlessly, but that's how it is. I love I, it. I get netted into it and, and participate wholeheartedly, <laughs> hypocritically, but... Um, 
that's how that's what we've come to. So the poem is a good document for the time. <clears throat> it's a it's wry <clears throat> and it's uh, allusions to the formality of Boston and everything. I think that's kind of funny. I don't know why anyone would think <clears throat> that a woman might not as easily lend herself to this as a man uh, from what I've heard and observed. And so it's important. Uh, it takes a look at the times. It's, it's an ancient theme, anger and uh, the resolution of it and the sort of cathartic resolution of it and uh, the insight, uh, fear. I think fear is something people are overlooking when they're criticizing the young culture today, mm -hmm. the foreign culture, the immigrants, the black culture in calling them uncivilized or uncouth or different or whatever. There's a lot of fear in today's culture. There certainly is. So, and it wasn't overdone on that part, but it was very nicely inserted. So, you know, Bravo on an emotionally very, very satisfying poem. Um, and um, which, which counts in the end, if poems aren't telling us how we read the world emotionally and how we, are in it emotionally, then poems aren't doing anything. So, I I I thought it was I thought it was very satisfying in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I love that Bill can smoke in class. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a class. And Jill, well, I'm in I'm in pajamas and Bill's smoking. Like this is a dream come true. And Bill is in London. Oh, nice. And Jill is in New York. And I'm so glad you're both here today. Me too. Uh, me, me too. <laughs> uh, will, will I jump in and say what please. I liked about it? Um, yes, please. Uh, well, I, 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 uh, two things really. Well, I'm probably more, but two um, spring to mind immediately. One was just the way in which it seemed so artless. It just uh, everything flowed naturally, but one senses that um, that. Uh, spontaneity or seeming spontaneity is actually carefully contrived and then the contrivance is as it were concealed um the other thing i liked was the the way in which um we have a um a, a kind of language game almost like a wittgensteinian language game you know people are acting and then they manage at the end to um step outside the language game into probably another language game because maybe there is no such thing as naturalness or authenticity but just for a moment um the coming together the sort of uh, the the hug the clinch uh, seems to be an escape from the play acting and language games which uh, we necessarily are embroiled in mm -hmm. and which um prevent us i suppose from achieving anything uh truly authentic and yet all that happens uh um, just very smoothly so this, it's only in a sense when one steps back and on reflection that one realizes that um, that's the sort of animating structure of the poem I buy that yes Thank definitely you. John yeah John. among the many things I like in the poem is the uh, suggestion that all of us are really composed of multiple personalities, not just one. We have all these facets. There's the, the kind version, the angry version, the fearful version. Um, and it's a really acknowledgement of a total person. And to see the person go from one extreme to another is just very, very satisfying. And I think one of the key words in the poem really is, is perfect posture, because that is the attitude that we all take in any kind of situation we were just posturing mm -hmm. and um you know sort of play acting on who we are and we're trying to be our best selves but sometimes our lesser angels come to the fore and, and overcome us and it's it just it's very very satisfying and um what i like in particular is the image of the bridge in the poem it's nothing is made of it but the bridge is so important because it introduces the idea of separation and connection. Mm. And, you know, which is what happens at the end, the bridge is mentioned a second time, and then the emotions are bridged and the people are bridged. And so you have this connection. And it's just very satisfying to see that. And it wasn't sort of hyped up. 
it was just subtly put in there and it was very very effective that way i think that 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 that's a very good example of one of the things that bill was just talking about which is the way there is this very there's a very subtle construction in this poem it's beautifully organized and in a kind of sneaky way yeah. and and in a kind of understated way it's not just saying oh you know look look how brilliant i am but it's brilliant because there's this undercurrent in terms in terms of the language itself and in images like the bridge, which I, I, I think is it's, it's so exactly right that the bridge is there at the beginning of the poem, but the bridge is there at the end of the poem also. And that bridge takes on a, a much, in its, in, its, in its understated way, it takes on a, a, a very large meaning in, in the poem. Um, so I, I'm I'm so glad you 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 mentioned that. The we changes, doesn't it? The the, the 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 pronoun initially is the we of two people who are playing the same game, consenting to play the same game, initiated equally into it and capable of playing their roles effectively. But by the end, the we has become something uh much more moving. It's a, um, a, a we which has been fabricated by two individuals and isn't particularly underwritten by any kind of um, social norm. Uh, uh, but the more poignant for that. Just two ladies yeah. hugging. It's two ladies <laughs> hugging. Yes. Yeah. Susan, Susan Weiner, we had we had a little conversation about the poem yesterday, and I I, I would re really love to everyone else to hear what you what you had to say about it. Um, uh, I was so moved. Well, I was just so struck by the veracity and the movement of the emotions which which you talked about and and found that I was totally caught up and ended up in tears at the end. And something I found striking was that I couldn't imagine that this wasn't something you had really experienced and been part of and had found a way in the rhythm of the verse and in the shaping of how things move through it and the surprises and the use of italics and and whatever to to suddenly catch us in that the clinch of of what two people who suddenly see one another as human beings who are are loving and scared and in the same condition human condition um uh, embrace and um that i just find it perfect oh thank you yeah it happened <laughs> oh, yeah of course um yeah i have a bunch of those like these i do this i do that poems that frank o'hara talks about um uh I didn't when I like my first book, I was saying the sonnets about um, execution. So I when I when I was a younger writer, it was important to me to not be writing about myself. And then this one, I had a fellowship at the Coleman Center and I told um, Joe O'Connor is a novelist and he had the office next to mine. And I told him this story and he was like, that's a poem. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess so. So then it was kind of one of the first ones that I ever wrote that was just like, I do this, I did like a thing happened to me. I'm gonna write it down um, and see and see what happens from there. Uh, yeah, and now it's like my whole shtick. <laughs> things, <laughs> things happen to me. <laughs> uh, probably everybody, oh, Jennifer, please. Yeah, I will see my, 
my reception's going in and out. So if if I just go back to my name, that's why. But just to add to the great things people have already said, I, I and to underline them, uh, the title accident, Mass Ave, um, you know, it speaks to Bill's point too, it seems to me. And, and the accident isn't just what happened, but it makes me think about a poem, or if Jill says, this is, if you say it's your shtick now, <laughs> that this is what makes a poem. There's something that happens out of the plan of things or out of the norm. And then it, it goes into this little space where it happens to the reader too. And I think it, it all, it reminds me, I was thinking about that Mass Ave, like, like, accident, Mass Ave, it's the address, but also that it starts with Mass Ave and Boston, and it comes back to Mass Ave and Boston. And it's this little social space. It's, it says, how do we find out who we are socially through accidents? Again, that's that's Bill's point, right? We're, we're caught up in a game and then we maybe we drop it or it shifts. But, but I keep thinking too of Bishop's waiting room that starts with Aunt Consuelo in Worcester, Massachusetts, and then goes back to that space where we locate ourselves in these names of the places and so on. You know, that, that a poem is a little space where something opens up and you think, I am a we, you are, a, you know, I'm one of them, we are both of us. With, with maybe the distinction that we say Mass Ave, right? Like that's all, it's not like saying Worcester, Massachusetts. Mm. <laughs> um, and so right there, it, it, it's a shift to, uh, I mean, Bishop's poem is about how we place ourselves in language too, but this is much more the the ways of talking, colliding. Anyway, that's all, you, you say it happens, but again, it's got this nice shape of coming back and not just coming back to where it started, but to that locution, like, okay, now we'll go back to the things that are addresses and places on a map. But anyway, love it. Yeah, you're there, thank you. Uh, Susan, yeah. Hi, thank you so Hi. much. Um, I was, I love the poem and it's a story. So um, that just right away is wonderful. I noticed it was written in 2012, which is, 11 years ago. It's it's even older than that. It was just published in, by the Poetry Foundation in 2012. Wow. I had, the, I had the fellowship in New York in 2005. So it probably happened in like 2002. And so then that yeah. that's an eternity now. And the language You're so old, is, Susan. The, I am. The, well, the, 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 the language is commonplace now, but when when it was first published, I'm curious how how it was received. I mean, yeah, people, I don't think anybody's ever been mad at me for swearing. Like, is that what you mean? Like, well, I wouldn't have put it that way, but was there some, reser were, were there people who had reservations or, oh, you were like, you, or were critical not, or? No, yeah, everybody, I, I mean, yeah, people love this poem. It's like my most popular poem. I see. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I think it's probably, I think it's that it turns around so that it's not just an angry screed. It, um, it, it breaks it open so that by the end of it, you're not, you're not getting yelled at anymore. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. That was that one of that won a push card prize, didn't it? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I won so many push cards, Lloyd. It's hard to keep track. <laughs> I, I know. Three. I've won three. I'm very three. proud of it. Yeah. This is a very big deal. <laughs> uh, uh, Denise had her hand up. Oh, Denise. Uh huh. Everything okay? No, but I'm not going to worry about it now. I'm going to take a break from trying to thaw water pipes. Um, but thank you for this this poem, Jill. I hadn't read it before. And now, of course, it's on a list of poems that I want to read to other people. Oh. Um, but the, you know, the description of why the emotional arc is so satisfying, I think, is spot on. And the the poem that it made me think of immediately um, is 
Naomi Shihab Nye's poem, Gate A4. Oh, I love that poem. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's so good. But it's it's got a similar arc where, you know, somebody is terrified and wailing in Al Albuquerque Airport because she thinks her flight's been canceled. And then, you know, the, there's a page for somebody who speaks Arabic and the narrator runs in and, you know, explains things. And then the, the, um, the, the joy and reconciliation are not just between those two people, but it spirals out and takes- And food, like they, the lady yes. shares food with the poet and then everybody's like, then it's a party. Yes, and, and you know, the, the cookies have these powdery sugar on them and everybody's covered in powdery sugar and the children start running around. It, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, and that made me think of um, this book by William Empson, some versions of pastoral. Uh -huh. And both of these poems are clearly pastoral poems that end in such a huge reconciliation that, that it does spread out in waves and, and is enough to produce tears in the reader or listener. So thank you. Thank you. Lloyd, I didn't quite realize that this was just going to be like me having like sitting here in my pajamas while people say nice things about me. Yeah, I would have done it a lot sooner. It's really nice. Oh, <laughs> well, you could do it again. <laughs> um, I I was just gonna, um, I, uh, Jennifer, I, I I you 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 as as you often do, anticipate. <laughs> Uh, certainly one of, I, I think our minds work in, in similar ways about poetry, but I, I was, I was also wanted to raise the issue of the title and, um, and, um, I was going to say to, I don't know if in London, Bill, you know that Boston is the has the worst traffic of any city in the United States. And so. Yeah, I didn't. But, well, now you do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Nor did I even know whether and, until it was read out the first time that Mass Ave was actually going to be spoken Mass Ave. Um, I, that's, that's how Bostonians refer to it, is it? Yeah, it's yep. Massachusetts Avenue. And so it's, would, would, it, would no one ever say Massachusetts Avenue? Mass Ave. No. Oh, right. Okay. Mm. Not if they're from Boston. Right. Uh, <laughs> Wait, I, don't, um, I don't know about uh, <clears throat> the worst traffic, but we have the reputation of being the worst drivers. drivers. Mass holes. We're yeah. mass holes. We drive yeah, terrible. Yeah, it's the it's the the most ill-tempered drivers in 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 the known universe. So, the, 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 I think the, we're the, assertive. I don't know about ill-tempered. Like you know, it works. It worked out. No, you're right. What, what what I what I think of as the um what in quotes the Boston left turn <laughs> is from the right lane at a busy intersection without signaling yeah and i think the signal is this like <laughs> that's it and then once in the intersection changing their mind and going another direction <laughs> yes <laughs> right <laughs> also 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 true all of that all of that being said there's a great silent irony in the very first line where she's actually stopping at a red light that's <laughs> that, that becomes terribly <laughs> ironic in this context who uh, stops yeah. stopped at a red light yeah i, I hadn't I, and I actually hadn't taken in how shocking that is <laughs> um uh but um kind of to, to go back to to Jennifer's point a little bit and I, I I I love the association with Elizabeth Bishop's um in the waiting room uh and and this poem and that, another poem that, that that brings me to tears but the 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 issue about um the the local 
in conjunction with or versus the the um uh you know the the, the large and and universal and here is a poem i mean i actually i one of one of my favorite moments in in the poem although it's a very understated moment uh the, the the phrase it being Boston <laughs> and and that the colloquial the co colloquialism of the title and this being Boston being the traffic here being notoriously awful and and that it that it's um I actually read this poem uh to a, to a group of people a few weeks ago and someone said it's such a boston poem yeah. and 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 that's really true but it's not just and i think this was sort of what jennifer was getting at before and that there's this there is this sort of bridge and there is this sort of conjunction between something that's both very local and if it were too local, it would be a much smaller poem. Mm. But maybe the largeness of the poem comes from the way it begins as something, begins even in the title as something so local and 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 close to home. Um, Denise, yeah. Yeah, um, the the mass uh, center for the book has challenges, reading challenges for every month of the year. And the challenge for the month of February this year is to read a book that's set in your city or state in Massachusetts. And I think that's an acknowledgement that reading about something that's local can be a gateway to a more expansive view of reading and what reading can offer yeah. um so i just i just thought i'd put that out there thank you yeah thanks for having writing such a, a great local universal poem <laughs> thank you john yeah in addition to being this being a local poem which becomes a national poem and then becomes a uh a world poem i think this poem should be included in any kind of manual written for extraterrestrials to be able to understand what human <laughs> beings are. I mean, this I mean, that's the Smithsonian, John. The well, Smithsonian this is, is the manual. This is beyond the Smithsonian. This is the next level up. It's the a, universal. A satellite. Yeah. <laughs> so it works on many levels in that way. <laughs> I love that. Mary, were you? You 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 look like you were gonna you were about to say something, but it, it's funny. I really wasn't, but I was thinking about I. It's a, such a silly thing, but one of my favorite phrases in it is "unnaturally angled chins." <laughs> it's really not worth the contribution, but um, yeah, the drama, the theatricality, and um, I all the things. I've just really been enjoying the discussion and. Uh, and agree with everything everyone's been saying. I I, I um, had very bad experiences driving in Boston as a young driver, and I can absolutely, yeah, I'm right there. But um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a wonderful poem. But I love I love that unnaturally angled chin, uh, chins, and I love that we both knew. I've just kind of marked it up. I've been doing little circles here and there all oh, over. Nice. The pages um and of course the tone i mean it's kind of we've all been kind of talking about the ending but the actual quote there we were scared weren't we is so phenomenally touching um going from the we that know the routine that know the shtick we're supposed to do to this we admitting um fear it's just so lovely i'm so glad we had a chance to hear it twice. Thank you. Yeah, I love hearing Lloyd read it. 
Yeah. Can I ask um, Jill a question? Um, Lord, yes, please. Uh, uh, it's, it's really about line endings, and it was partly, um, it, um, well, I, I'm kind of preoccupied with them anyway, but it was also prompted by your mentioning Frank O'Hara. In his um, personist manifesto, he talks about going on his nerves because um, he's, he's just, as it were, he, there's no sort of fixed form um, laid down in advance, which determines where the line endings will come. So you just have to trust something or other, nerves, intuition. And yes. um, I, I wondered um, what degree of um, manipulation they had undergone, whether that was a phase in the poem where you were fiddling around with lines, deciding whether to lengthen one or shorten it or whatever. Yeah, I often, I write in blank verse a lot, like, uh, um, and I, I count the stresses and I count the feet, um, in part because I so often write in form, but then for free verse too, I just like, I feel like it helps me, it helps me edit, you know what I mean? So then, but then I, then I fuck with it. <laughs> like, right. so it'll start out, like, it starts out at prose and then it goes to blank verse and then like, eventually I, I get mm -hmm. like, um, I want some, like, I have different kinds of pleasure. Like, I like the kind of slant rhyme between backs and truck. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, sure. I just start giving myself little presents and how I want, yes. what I want to do with the new and do. There's like, you yeah, know, it's sort yeah. of heroic couplets, but just, yeah. just where yeah. I like it. Some of the line endings seemed almost to have a narrative element. I, I was wondering about, um, hang on a moment. Uh, yeah, I, I got out of the car yelling, uh, swearing at this woman. A little woman. It's almost as if um, the woman is still in the car when the eye gets out and starts shouting at her. But then, sort of the 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 um, the other woman gets out, and now it becomes apparent that she's a little woman. And the eye, who will later be revealed to be enormous, is presumably towering over her and already feeling a bit guilty about um, um, shouting at someone so much more diminutive than she. Yeah. And not not a native speaker. Yeah, you suddenly right, like yeah. you start checking your privilege, and you just you realize you're an asshole. Um, right. She did fucking hit my car. Like yes, but you're already <laughs> kind of committed to the language game at that point. Right. You have your part. Right, play, I'm already yeah. an asshole. Like yes, <laughs> yeah. I got to be a big one. Right. <laughs> I I the something that something that occurred to me because of course even without counting syllables or, or, or accents, uh, it, from the distance, it looks like blank verse uh, or pentameter of some sort. And, and that in some way, it also reminds me, I mean, if I just saw this poem on the page without seeing the title or the author, I would think, oh, it kind of looks like one of Coleridge's conversation poems. And that, and and I think there's something behind that. That it it is um, that it, it it is kind of pretending to be a sort of very casual. And I did this, and I did that, or I thought this, and I thought that, or we were saying to each other, or something like that. And it's all very, um, that, that element is, um, is really kind of, um, I know undermined isn't exactly the right word, but it's, 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 it's undercut by, um, real, just, amazing skill and attention to details and attention to language and the line breaks and um, the rhythms of the lines and the internal rhymes. It's it, that, you know, that even, even with all those fuck this and fucking that, which is not exactly understated, <laughs> But there, but that there, that there. But it's is... understating in a poem, like yeah, because it's right. a poem, it it undoes that work. So yeah, there, those forces of of being colloquial and being funny and um, versus like it's a poem. So yeah, trying to like undo the kind of like pedestal of of what it means to be a poem is that's the project, right? Like that's the yeah. that's yeah. the pleasure. Yeah. But if and... it, 
if it does strike you as blank verse initially, Lloyd, from the look on the page, when you read it, it then turns out to be both more and less formal than blank verse, doesn't it? Because it's not committed to decasyllabics, but um, it, it will give itself latitude to shorten and lengthen lines as it sees fit. But then, of course, sometimes it will move almost towards heroic couplets, although with muted rhymes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and cer certainly the, the 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 closer you get to it, and the more you look at the you know just every it seems to me unerring detail that um uh the that 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 the skill and the sort of thoughtfulness of the construction of the poem as a whole and and really from moment to moment just seems uh breathtaking to me impeccable and um I'm so glad you're recording this <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Lloyd, i can, can just I... like play it for myself whenever i feel like an asshole good <laughs> yes there, there jennifer two little impeccable things i'd like to comment on good Good. Um, and the and the first one I was trying to think about um, this question of uh, well the, the the first one's in line four that like like cranked or wheel where when we get into the poem the narrator could be a kind of neutral narrating voice um, I stopped at blah 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 but the like makes it spoken and it also it shifts that's when it gets really active like cranked your wheel rammed right into my side the yeah. the, the rhythm kicks up and disrupts anything that might feel like neutral blank verse mm. narration moving along I, and I, I i will interrupt you for a second because of course you're I, you're absolutely right and i think that like is a really is just a kind of is one of those sort of ping moments where suddenly you're really hearing the voice Mm -hmm. But you're also, it's also in a line that has Buick and backed and cranked. And it has, it has those sounds, which are really, you know, th that are in incredibly skill <laughs> skillful. There's a real ear in this for both, for both the spoken language, but also the underlying poetic language that um you almost don't think of because of the colloquialism but you were you you had another you said you had two well no i i love that you added that because it feels like okay that's where the line buckles that's mm -hmm. where it gets crowded where the sounds it's both things it's the speaking voice taking over but it's the sound of things taking over and it's like okay you have the line that's like a road and then you have a crash in the line and the crash is colloquial and the crash is the rhythm and the crash is the sound of the language. Um, I like I like all those things. Um, Me too, but, Jonathan. And, and it just <laughs> it just amplifies the the location I zeroed in on. It's like so for me, that's the first little crash in the poem, <laughs> the first little <laughs> dent in yeah. in the line. Mm -hmm. But again, most of the most of the poem splits into colloquial is in the reported speech rather than in the narrating so it, that, it's not true everywhere but like that I like that launch where it's mixed and the other place I feel kind of coming out of it is uh down in the second stanza when 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 we're both stuck because we know what it's supposed to be but that doesn't work so uh it's in the but there was no fucking dent it's that it's that the fucking in that line in the in the narrated line it, it it's not i think there i think there are other ones of those in the poem but but this one too is like the slippage out of that okay i am supposed to use mm. use that word but i i can't attach it to a dent because because right. it isn't there and and that's where there was then there was nothing for, for us to do so I stopped yelling and she looked at the tire you know everything everything quiets down there and I just like the little stepping stone of the 
of the fucking in that line too. So coming right. out of it. Well, it's 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 almost as if it's the that the, the the fucking dent is not just quoting, but it's also kind of generic. You know, that's that's, that's what the kind of dent it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You who do you had your hand up a minute ago? I would love to know and to see or to hear the first draft of this poem before uh, you before you began. Why, before you began to edit or or structure or deal with certain kinds of elegant and poetic details, uh, matters of uh, counting counting syllables and end of uh, end phrases and so on, um, do you have a copy of that? Let's look, Yehuda. Um, I do have a big file of drafts. I think I would find that I would find that fascinating because I want to see what the, how how the transformation took place in your mind and what your initial uh, you know what you found initially exciting and satisfactory and what you needed to structure um, and to actually not just structure but to make it satisfactory to improve it to to make it more uh, poignant and and pointed yeah, I'm not. These all look like the published version. Uh -huh. Well, I was going. I was thinking far beyond before that. You know, I'm thinking. I as a composer, I think in those terms. I I I so uh, revere Beethoven because he didn't know what the hell he was doing in the beginning, and the sketches are just disastrous, <laughs> and they become increasingly powerful. And the versions that he even thought he came up with at the end uh, are often not the final version. And he always came up, he always developed through manipulation, through judgment, through what must have been a very powerful, but not very specific uh, uh, vision that yeah. he had what he wanted to, to express. And it seems misty in the beginning. And he, yeah, anyway, that's- You that's have to find your way. Yeah, I mean, in general, like what what is happening in the draft phase is like it's it's like two pages long, and it's all single space and it's prose. Like that's just like me like pouring it out, every single thing I can think of, and then I'm kind of carving the poem out of like I can I can find the shape, like a sculptor of like what what I get rid of all the stuff that doesn't go. <laughs> yeah, well, with yeah. seeing seeing that I think would be for me would be very nourishing. I would yeah, love. I wish I it was. If, I, yeah, I can I can probably show you like a, a more recent poem, but it doesn't look like I'm not seeing the drafts. It must be on an old computer. Sorry, you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry too. <laughs> <laughs> well, what 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 recent poem were you thinking of? Well, um, I have the one that Three Penny just took that I gave you called "What We Are For." Yeah. Um, you, what, would you like to read that and yeah. then? And then yeah, let me let me share my screen, and then you guys can see it with me. That would be mm, there. We go. Get over there. Yeah, what we are for. At the stop and shop, I joke with the girl helping me find the star anise that it looks like someone left her a chicken bone on the shelf. Oh, isn't that nice? She laughs. They wanted you to have a fun surprise, I tell her. Tell the checkout lady I love her turquoise sparkle nails. The gallery assistant I love his sweater. It makes him look like a fuzzy baby bee. Have a good day, we all call to each other. Have a good one, a good weekend, good night. In the endless self-service kiosk line at the post office before Christmas, I tell everyone ahead of me who tries to open the self-service kiosk drop-off box that it is full. They have to walk their packages over to the counter, enormous stacks toppling on the far right. Now you, do, now you know too. The third time I tell someone and they don't thank me, the lady cop in line with me just shakes her head. They could at least say thank you. When she says this, the last guy says, thank you. I say, no problem. When he's gone, me and the lady cop crack up. I live for this shit. Do you think he heard me? The lady cop asks. He 100% heard you, I tell her. And you are doing the Lord's work. 
Later, after the wine store and the library, I see her and her partner by their cop car. And she says, hey, you following me? And I yell, of course I'm fucking following you. You're the nicest lady cop in town. She is delighted. Her partner's confused. Tell him, she laughs. You're an angel of holiday politeness. I'm sticking with you, I tell her. Love this so much. Being able to walk through the world, making people briefly happy. Me here with them, but also here inside what this dumb grief is making. Purpose built for all this ache and love and awe. Um, and then, do I have a draft? I probably gave it a different title. Yeah, let me see if I can, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Stop share, start share. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I don't know your drafts. Yeah, this is like a little ways along. You can see like, I'm trying to figure out line breaks. And then this like, trying to figure out what I want to say about the end. Grief and tenderness and menopause working together inside me to create a machine purpose built for nurture, aching and love. Like I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting at it. You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to like talk myself into what it is gonna, what it's gonna be. Um, and the machine that grief has built. Oh yeah, and I left out the library girl. Um, having the conversation about novels with the girl at the library who's shelving them. But yeah, like that. I can email this to Lloyd so you guys can all have it. Shall I stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah, but what a what what a what a wonderful poem. Thank you. Um I I would oh Susan did you have a comment? Um, so I think I'm newer to poet. I know I'm newer to poetry than most of you. I didn't know you could write like this. And I'm curious, I'm curious what the, what the, I mean, someone mentioned Frank O'Hara, Bill did. What, what's the trajectory here? Who, how, how, when did this start? How does it, where is it going? Who are the poets? I don't know, Lloyd, is this confessionalism? <laughs> Lloyd knows more uh, about this stuff than I do. I just do it. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, but I think Bishop, like he's with all the people that you guys are mentioning are like, I feel like they're my whatever, four, huh. four yeah. figures. I, I, I mean, I, Oh God, it's so it's it's really complicated. Yeah, maybe it's too big a question, but no, no, but yeah, it's it's, it's a very it's a very good question to ask because um something you know, I think it happened in poetry a lot earlier than we think it did. Yeah. That we kind of think about Whitman as, you know kind of inventing American poetry. But I think maybe Emily Dickinson <laughs> invented American poetry and that when I think of American poetry, I really, you know, I, I, what, I what I look for, what I admire, uh, what gets to me is the way a spoken language gets trans um, transubstantiated into a poetic language. Um, yeah. And but there's that also, sorry, without, without losing the conversational quality. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I see that in in Alexander Pope. I, I see you. it in, in Wordsworth. Well, this hmm. this book, I was just at the Morgan, um, and Heduana, I guess is how you say this priestess's name. It's like the she's the first 
poet uh, and priestess like 5000 BC. And she wrote a poem called Exaltation to Inanna where she's invoking this goddess because she's so pissed off that this guy like put his hand on her in the temple. And so it's like, for, it's the first, it's the first person and it's rage and it's like righteousness. Like she's calling on this. She's like, you like, this is what this guy did to me. And this is how powerful you are. And I hope you fuck him up. Like it is, it's so bad and it's so personal and it's so old. Like, it's like, I'm this. You know, it's this little like uh, cuneiform Sumerian tablet that is the size of an iPhone. Like I, that like, and then it was such a, I mean, I never heard about this thing until I was at the morning, but then it was such a famous piece that Sumerian scribes studied it. Like they had this canon of 10 things that they used to like learn how to make their little Sumerian tablets. Um, so, so yeah, it's not old. It's not American. I mean, it's not new. It's not American. It, um, it's like vulnerability and honesty and um and you can do it even in sumerian on clay <laughs> what was it a oh, jane yeah hi i forget uh, sometimes to unmute myself um i love your poems oh. and i loved that first one that we read and I love the one you just read also. And I, I just wanna say, I feel like you're doing something that's very needed right now. And mm. so that even though the poem that we were, we've been studying you know, um, was written so long ago, it wasn't all that long ago when you think of the amount of you know, years and things, but-, but not this It's is, not Sumerian. Yes, it's not Sumerian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is the thing we need to do now. It's yeah. like, we, I'm sorry? We need to hug, hug yeah, it out. But, yeah. but also it's just, we, we've been going along the ways, you know, like this is what we do in Boston, you know, what, the ways we're supposed to be, you know, supposed to in terms of what, I don't know, but the way we do things. And then to kind of stop and see, well, where are we really? You know, did anybody bang into this car? Did you know what I mean? It's like, why are we I so think, mad all the time? I'm sorry. Why are we so mad all the time? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We start out fucking this and fucking that, you know. Um, and the, I love the bridge in a way because we went. A, you go across a bridge. You know, you cross a bridge, right. and we need to cross that bridge. And um, and what I hear in both poems is you, you know, you're just doing it in language. And, mm -hmm. and I love it. You know? Thank you. And I've Me been too. thinking, you're welcome. Really, <laughs> you're great. Um, I've been thinking very much of, you know, this is, this is what we need to do. Make all these little vignettes of our lives. Just make these spaces where we can come together, where, you know, the anger is away because do we really need it? Mm. Maybe we do it, do need it to get it out, right. but I don't know, yeah. you know. So I really love it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like COVID really fucked with me too. Like there was a yes. there was a time when I lived like that all the time, and then it went away, and then it's coming back. Mm. And it, so you, I don't know, you're freshly aware of how how lucky we are. I used yeah. to get it a lot because I teach in the prisons. And so I would be oh, like, wow. oh my God, I'm not incarcerated. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, every day waking up and being like, oh, I love my bed and I love my life. And I yeah. get to like cook the food I want. Like to be yeah. grateful for freedom yeah. is um, something we, we can take for granted unless we're working in prisons, unless we're quarantined, unless, you know, like um, we need the contrast to be able to see how lucky we are. Yes. But also I was listening on NPR to some program yesterday or something but it was all about awe mm. and and the fact that we are laughing and laughing and laughing and then suddenly we're crying mm. and the crying comes from that awe you know that it's not or that's a part of the awe you know mm. it's just I it's great <laughs> it's like I'm out of words <laughs> oh it's good yeah. Bill, could you read another one of my favorite poems 
Yeah. What? Cindy. Oh yeah. Let me let me find it and share it. Well, while Mention. you're finding, can I just ask Denise? Yeah. I need. Could you just write to me what the the Naomi Shiab Nye's poem that you mentioned was? Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry. Let's see. No, nope, thank you. Um, I mean. It's a, Jill mentioned um, teaching in the prisons and uh, this, um, there's some other driving in this, there's more driving in this poem. Yeah, uh, another but, Boston poem. Yeah, but I, I love this poem. So uh, while I've got you here. Sure. Uh, Cindy comes to hear me read. Cindy, not her real name. I met her in prison and people in prison, I give the fake names. I taught her Shakespeare, remember her frown, wide eyes, terror of getting things wrong. Her clear arguable thesis on Desdemona's motives, Desdemona's past. The last days were hard on her. It taking visible work to see things could be worse. Imagine, I did, but now she's out in jewelry and makeup, new clothes, haircut she chose and paid for. We hugged. We'd never hugged. It's not allowed. On the outside, you can hug whoever you want. She told me she has an apartment now, a window, an ocean view. She has a car, she told me, and we both cracked up. The thought of it wild, as far-fetched then as when you're a kid playing grown-up, playing any kind of house. She has a job. She drives there in traffic, each day, she sees the angry people, sweet, silly people, mad, God bless them, at traffic, at other cars. She laughs, she told me, laughs out loud, alone in her car. People around her, angry as toddlers, whole highways of traffic, everybody at the work of being free. Mm. That was beautiful. Sure. Oh, Jill, do you do you want to say anything else about your poems or those particular poems or accident mass have or I I mean I I think like you guys can do that too. Like just just enjoy your lives. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy your life and then write it down. It's hard to remember but then you, then you, then it's done. And then you get to be an archivist of your own life, the best. Jill, I love that you encompass so many emotions. It, it just, and it always ends like with a very, like uh, the hug or the, the, this poem leaving me feeling in tears. Like you both walk away and, and there is like what you just read like the anger of all these people in their cars and this woman who's like, I, I'm happy to be here. Oh my God, it's so great. Yeah. Not being incarcerated, not being dead. We're not sick. Like it's really, it's a fucking sweet deal most of the time. Yeah. yeah. By the I way, this it. is, that'd be a great title for a poem, a sweet fucking deal. <laughs> you can write that one, John. First one's free. <laughs> There's a message from Jim, from Jim Haber, um, uh, only connect. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Uh, boy, do I connect with you. <laughs> you guys are great. Lloyd, I miss you so much. Me too. But, and I envy you being in New York. Jonathan, yeah. Jill, I'm just wondering if you've ever tried playwriting if you've ever written anything for the stage and i, no. I asked that because uh, rather than thinking of other poets when i'm hearing these uh, i think of sam shepherd it's just oh. that very naturalistic uh, thank you 
that's a really nice compliment. Real, real, well, I, I love Sam Shepard, so they, me too. That, that, that is a, a compliment. But I, I wonder if, if 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 you've ever strayed beyond poetry to, to try something with a stage. I, I have a little bit. I I took a class in grad school, and then and then I tried writing a, a play that had a lot of ghost soldiers in it. When I was when I was cool. writing all those sonnets about executions, I got like really into these particular episodes of like a, a 1755 slave revolt. <laughs> Um, the Civil War. So I was trying verse plays to to think through some of that stuff. But the drag about everything that isn't poetry is that it's long and you have to count on other people. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I like I it when it's, when it's short and it's just me by myself and then I'm done. Plays are really hard. Yeah. They're hard to do and they're really hard to get right. And that somehow you put you put language on a stage, and it kind of becomes stagey. I right. mean, there are, obviously there are great playwrights, right? And who can, who get it right? Right, like Sam Shepard with like working against that. It's so so satisfying when it happens. Right, but, or yeah. Beckett, or I think of you know I think of Shakespeare and Webster. Uh huh. And. Shakespeare is very, I mean, he's, he's the greatest and it's very Shakespearean, but Webster, Webster is really, it's really English mm. and, and it's, it's scary. Mm. Um, anyway, I, I it, it, pl plays are hard. Yeah. There's so many bad ones. It's so many bad ones. <laughs> yes. I don't want I don't want to write God. a bad song. <laughs> God. Oh, I know. So it, yeah. what about Beckett or Lowell. Well, Beckett, I I I, I yeah, I mentioned Beckett. Okay. And I think yeah, and that's and that but that in a way you know, and you know i think lowell is great and but i think beckett and lowell are writing poems that go on the stage hmm. and and um and that and they're great but they're they're, they're not they're not exactly plays or they are but that's why you like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> right 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 um Yehudi, Yehudi um, wrote music for Robert Lowell's uh, Old Glory, the three. Oh, cool. Short plays that he did. That's amazing. So the premiere performance in New York in 64, I think, or something. Baller. You're an American treasure. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. That's true, too. That's That's very true. But um i don't know any other any other last thoughts um is, is, Ray, is raymond carver someone who matters to you yeah i love carver i love teaching those short stories yeah um I, and he he was what was i i um, brought to mind for me first when i read your poem oh thank you gosh you guys that's so nice i see stephen and i see john okay stephen First and then John. I'm just going to mention about the um, two physical bridges in the poem. Um, it seems like the poem is a moving from unconsciousness to self consciousness. And I just realized now that uh, she doesn't say any of those things that she, that she says. She says she could have said them, there's mm. something that could happen. And the, the two, she mentions the, the massive bridge at the beginning and the end, but the physical bridges are the um, stanza breaks. And, and they're so wonderfully self-conscious. The first stanza is all the things that could have happened in this accident, but she doesn't say that out loud. We're supposed to say this, but we don't. And then suddenly she realizes, oh, that's not the way the world is. I, I'm not hit. We weren't hurt. There isn't an accident. Everything's now, fine. Now she's in a different place, which she's realizing what's going on. And then she speaks out loud. I think that's the only time she really does speak out loud. Oh, no, I swore at that lady. 
I thought she said that we could have said or we should have said. Well, yeah, when she didn't hit me, like that's when I'm like, like I didn't have to say the stuff about the suspension, but I did say, uh, what the fuck were you thinking? You fucking blind. What the fuck is going on? Like, yeah, you, you, I yelled. Yeah, but it says, uh, you, you, uh, you can't. The thing uh, to do. Yeah, the thing to, as if it's almost a possibility. Right. But the, after the second bridge, now you're actually thinking self-consciously and then you feel for her. And maybe you're aware of your own self and then you speak for her. We, yeah, we, we were scared, weren't we? And you offer her, you know, a physical embrace. So you cross these two bridges and you become more conscious. Like in the other poems too, in your unconscious way, we skip along the surface and all of a sudden something, some gravity pulls us down. And, and I gotcha. We know where we are. Yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one of my favorite uh, phrases in the poem is at the end of the first stanza, um, in the penultimate line, uh, my whole arms. And it just struck me as such a wonderful, wonderful image. It's very vivid, those last lines. And I wrote in my margins, this is like ballet. <laughs> and then I realized that the entire poem really could be turned into a ballet, as long as you don't make it too obvious and just too predictable. Uh, but that gesture of my whole arms is, I saw um, Da Vinci's picture of the man with his arms out in a perfect circle. And here's this woman, it's you know, doing this, you know, not, and it's not said specifically, but the, ad, but the adjective whole arms says exactly or presents exactly what we are to look at and, and envision. And it is totally ballet-like and it really just, gives this sort of artistic three-dimensionality. So it's like mm. music and, and dance and certainly language. And so mm. it's just a very rich poem in that way. And I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, take up space. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, there is, a, there is an, an American ballet um, called Filling Station. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, maybe early 30s something like that wow and um, um very amusing yeah and it actually takes place at a at a gas station somebody loves us all somebody loves us all yeah so. bill <clears throat> i've been <clears throat> obsessing about bill symes's comments about the uh, line breaks and there's an interesting way that the enjambments uh, create two different forms, one that you read on the page and one that you hear. Both Lloyd and Jill read across the enjambments without any particular attention to the line break, but most of them leave the predicate for the next line. Mm. So if you're reading it on the paper over and over again, there's a kind of tension you come to, uh, oh, just, <clears throat> but she hadn't hit my truck. She hit the tire. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens um, pretty right. Her car was fine, too. We saw this while we were yelling. Um, so that, um, I, you know, I would never read it that way out loud. <clears throat> and even on the page, I, I don't it. exactly read it. But repeatedly, there's a slight, uh, a, a, a slight conflict mm. between what I see on the page and how I'm hearing it <clears throat> that creates an interesting and I think rather pleasant kind of tension. I like that too. I like, it's like, it makes me think of like, you know, when you hold magnets in the wrong ends. And so there's that little push, bit of, yeah. yeah, there's that tension that like, so it, it, it helps it come off the page. A little bit. Thanks. Good eye. I think, you know, I I I don't think that line breaks, um, especially mean. I mean, and in fact, I think they don't mean a pause. But I think what happens at the end of a line and at the beginning of a line get a new kind of burst of energy because of where they are. In well, so, I mean, certainly when I'm 
reading out loud. And when I hear people I like hearing read aloud, I, I, pa pausing at the end of the line drives me absolutely crazy. <laughs> You know, un unless there's, you know, there but it's was, a visual pause, like it's a visual what pause. saying, yeah, like we get, so you get both, you get yeah, yeah, more bang for your buck. Well, and often the line is broken where you'd take a breath, a, 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 right. a split second breath anyway. These are rather um, purposely, I think, or rather insistently at any rate, placed where the stupidest thing you could do would be to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, more friction. Well, I uh, thank you so much. I thank I, you guys. I, wow, so like my friend Mike is going to be like, oh, now how do we like deflate my enormous ego? For we'll have to. Oh, no, don't. <laughs> Just don't. He Just... did read my. He, he says that you read it better than me. That's true. Yeah. Oh, I, don't know. Well, I, I mean, I, come on. He's, he's a world class reader. I can't compete. I'm too young. I, yeah. You, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you are. You are too young. But, it's a child, um, really. Yeah. I'll get better, you guys. Sorry. No, no. I, I read it the way I hear you read it um, in, my, in my head. <laughs> um, this was just great. And um, thank you so much for you're in New York and you mm -hmm. took the time to do this. Uh, Marita, our next, our next discussion is March 4th. That's right. And I don't know, I think I, I'm sort of toying which poem to, to choose, but I haven't picked it yet. And um, I, I thank you so much, everyone, for, um, for being here today. And I, I knew this would be I mean, it was certainly special for me. I, 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 you, you are one of very few living poets. We, 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 who, who. Oh, sweet. Have contributed to this. And, and thank you, thank you so much. Enjoy New York. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. I'm glad I'm still living. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it up for as long you as I can. You all are. Please, please do, <laughs> please do. And Marita, thank you so much. The well, perfect I, host, as always. And oh, it, this has been my pleasure. And Jill and Lloyd, Jill, this was wonderful. And uh, and Lloyd, as always, it's always wonderful. And everyone, thanks for being here. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. And I'll send thanks out a you. link when the keep recording warm. is ready. Keep warm, <laughs> even if you're not in Boston. Yeah, everybody keep warm. Yeah. Be well, everyone. Take care.